Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little for PokerNews.com and today we have another hand from a $2,200 buy-in tournament that I played. We were on bullet number two. I just busted on the previous hand I made for Poker News. You can find it at uh, youtube.com slash pokercoaching. I have lots and lots of videos there. We've been at it for many years. If you've not checked out my YouTube channel, have not subscribed, go there. It's completely free to click subscribe and if you click the notification box, you'll be emailed whenever I upload new content for you to watch. So, do that. I think they have a notification box there. If they don't, they should have one. Um, so anyway, here we have a raise from early position with king-queen suited. Notice I do not just shove all in. If you follow a shove-fold chart, it can tell you that you should shove all in, I think. But you really should not be open jamming anything for 20 big blinds. A lot of people go very wrong by just printing out shove or fold charts without recognizing that we have more options than just shove or fold. We can limp, we can min-raise. If you are folding, or if you're fo blindly following all in or fold charts, and you have something like 15 big blinds or less, you are definitely making substantial errors. If you're following reshove charts at all, where if someone raises, if you're following a chart to tell you what to shove with or fold, you're also making big errors because you're allowed to call. You're going to find that if you utilize all of your options, you get to play more hands profitably, which leads to more profits. Strategy is going to be slightly more difficult to implement, but you'll make way more money if you learn to play well. Spend a little bit of time and learn to play well. All right, here we raise the king-queen suited. Definitely better than jamming. Button and big blind call. Flop comes seven, five, four, one club. And in this scenario, we are just going to check fold. It's a little bit unfortunate because we have two over cards and backdoor flush draw, but this flop connects very well with the big blind. And if I make any bet here, he's just gonna check shove all in if he has any piece of this. Also, the player on the button could have connected with this. Probably not so well, but if he does have a spade draw, he's not going to fold. If he does have um, an over pair, he's not going to fold. So this is a spot where I definitely don't want to bet, and I just have to concede. A lot of people look at this and think, oh, man, I should have just shoved all in. Then I would have won the pot. Well, unless you run into good cards, and then you're in bad shape, right? So don't be results-oriented. Instead, realize that this is the more profitable line, and, um, well, it didn't work out this time. So we're gonna check fold, but then we turn a club draw. Oh boy. And the big blind now bets 4,000, so a third pot. All right, in this scenario, you have to ask, does the big blind have any or many sevens in his range for trips? And the answer is obviously yes. He's gonna defend against my preflop 2.3 big blind raise with a lot of hands containing a seven, a seven, king seven, queen seven suited, jack seven suited, 10-7 offsuit, 9-7 offsuit, 8-7 offsuit, 7-6 offsuit, 7-5 offsuit, right? He has all those hands. So I do not want to be raising here with anything because my opponent has a nut advantage. It's very important to always ask who has the range advantage and who has the nut advantage. And when I check behind on the flop and when the turn brings another 7, I do not have the nut advantage at all and I do not have the range advantage at all. And for that reason, I should not have a raising range at all, especially when my opponent bets small and gives me great odds to draw. So I'm going to call... Some people may look at this and think, oh, but your opponent could already have a full house. I mean, yeah, they do. I sure hope we don't get a club. <laughs> but this is a scenario where you're going to be live enough. And when you are playing shallow stack, you just have to be willing to take more risks. Now, I don't mean risk as in, risk as in, risk as in, oh my gosh, risks as in going all in. I mean risks as in calling and seeing if you get there. So we're going to call button calls as well, which... Probably isn't a whole lot of sevens, but could be over pairs, could be ace high, could be spade draws, could be club draws, right? And now we river the queen. So maybe we got there, maybe we didn't. And the big blind checks. So when the big blind checks the river, you can start to be relatively sure that he does not have a seven. Because if he had a seven, he'd probably just value bet and try to get called, right? If he had a straight, he'd probably just value bet and hope to get called. So I think we have the best hand in this scenario a lot. The question is, should we value bet it? Just because you have the best hand does not mean you should value bet. It's a very important concept. You, need to want, you want to make sure that when you bet, you can still get called by worse hands a decent chunk of the time. And it's more than 50% in situations like this because we want to make sure we have an edge when we're putting our last bit of money into the pot. So we actually have to be pretty confident that we have the best hand to value bet in the spot. So maybe we want to value bet and get called by worse hands, maybe only 40% of the time instead of like 48% of the time. 
Uh, we also do run the risk of getting raised if we do bet small, which would be a big bummer, but I'd probably call it off at that point. Maybe. Ugh, it'd be nasty. This is definitely a spot where when you're playing live poker, I, I was playing live poker, by the way. When you play live poker and you win the tournament, they give you trophies like this. Um, whenever you are playing live, you can very often look and tell. Like maybe the big blind is just done with it. Or maybe the guy on the button is just done with it. Or, and, and I just know I have the best hand here very frequently. If I'm very sure I have the best hand in the spot, I'm definitely value betting. But even then, I, if I'm not even sure, like say I'm playing this hand online, I think I probably still would put the value bet in. So the question then becomes how much should you bet? And here I'm trying to get called by an under pair, right? Like pocket eights or ace five or something like that. And when you are value betting with a marginal made hand, especially if your opponents are not like really world class, you are kind of playing first level poker of how much will they call with the worst hand. And I think this might actually be a little bit too much. I think a bet size of something like 8,000 would be better. Because if I bet 8,000, then a hand like pocket ace will call every time. Ace five will probably call. But if I bet 14, those hands may start to fold out. And I really don't want to get folds by those hands because that's what I'm trying to get called by, right? So I think I would have preferred a slightly smaller bet by me. Anyway, button calls and, um, well, I just win. So perhaps a big value bet was better in this scenario, or maybe we just got a little bit lucky. It's important to realize that just because a specific size works out in one scenario does not mean it was better. Because for all I know, maybe the guy on the button had queen jack of spades, a queen ten of spades, or queen nine of spades, right? And just got super unlucky to river the queen. Um, that said, maybe he had ace jack offsuit and made a superhero call. I don't know. And that is why poker is a difficult game because a lot of people look at this and say, oh, 14,000 bet on the river was great. He got called by the worst hand, so I'm just going to make 14,000 the bet every time without realizing maybe we actually got lucky. Or hey, maybe it actually is the best play. This is why it's important to study a ton away from the table and to do diligent uh, study of both your range and your opponent's range. And um, I think in this scenario, given it's really hard for my opponent to have a queen, and he probably has worse than a queen, and there's a player yet to act behind him in the big blind, although for all I know, maybe the big blind is just like obviously folding. If the big blind is obviously folding, then it's as if there's no one behind the button. But if there's someone behind the button, he really shouldn't be calling here all that often for 14K, especially if the player in the big blind is good and will check a seven some portion of the time. So I think a smaller bet would have been ideal in the spot, more like 8K. But hey, 14 is nice, and we won a nice pot. So that's me at four today. Let me know how you feel about this value betting spot on the river. I think a lot of people fail to get value in this spot. And if you do, let me know why. And resolve to get a little bit more out of line in these spots. I think you're going to find that, especially in small stakes games, people will call relatively small river bets kind of wide. So if you're not value betting in these spots, you're leaving money on the table. I realize it is awful. It feels awful whenever you value bet the river and get raised. But you just don't get raised all that often, especially, especially if your opponents would bet with the nut hands themselves. Because imagine the guy in the big blind, let's say he always bets the river with a seven. Well, he doesn't have a seven, right? Let's also say the guy on the button would always raise with a seven on the turn. Well, it means he doesn't have a seven, right? Which means I basically have the nuts. And if I have the nuts, I need to value bet. And if you're not value betting, you are leaving money on the table. Don't do that. If you want to use poker to change your life, you must learn to play well. And if you don't, well, can't help you. <laughs> Study and work hard and good things will come. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Thanks for watching. And I'll talk to you next time.